Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, listeners. You know, I so appreciate you giving me some of your time, and today is totally going to be worth it. I know I say that every week, but I feel that way every week. Today, we are talking to Nancy May, who has a book on how to survive a 911 emergency. When I think back to the day my dad ended up in the hospital for 32 days, I think I really wish I had her book. So thanks for joining me, Nancy. Well, you are more than welcome. Thank you, Jennifer, for having me here as a guest. Between that and my podcast, Elder Care Success, we're like batting like 5,000 between fading memories, that, and, you know, every day is a good day, as I say. (laughs) That's true. You know, there's always something to appreciate, even on some days when you want to pull your hair out and just beat people. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. You can always find a little bit of ray of sunshine, even in the, even the darkest hour, I think. That's true. It's easy for me. I have a golden retriever. (laughs) (laughs) I have standard poodles. So (laughs) I would so totally have a standard poodle, but I can only imagine what their haircuts cost. Yeah. Yeah. About, about the same as mine. (laughs) Oh, see now the dog, even my husband costs more than me. I'm frugal girl. So, (laughs) but anyway, so why don't you, so tell us a little bit about yourself and then we'll go right into the topic. Sure. Well, you know, I came out of the corporate world, but as we, we don't typically end up in this role, taking care of our parents as the job that we are in our own professional life aspiring to, or maybe it's not the word, correct word aspiring to, because I think we always want to take care of those that we love and who cared for us over the years. But um, as time went on, uh, I was I was the oldest child of two. And my parents, we had these conversations over the course of our lives that I was going to be the one who would step in to help them when and if they needed it. Well, I did. And I did this from 1,200 miles away. We unraveled financial mess and re- right-sided all of that into including their own care. But when it comes time to really taking care of your parents, whether it be hands-on, around the corner, or long distance like I did from 1,200 miles away, there's always that first call to the paramedics or for help. Mm -hmm. Yep. And whether you do it or in the case with my folks, when they needed help, it was an aide who did it. My parents did it when we were kids, (laughs) although it was a different day and time. but. That's, that's that's a big scary moment when you you're not sure what to do and how to do it, and having to call for help, a paramedic, a first responder, whatever it is, over the course of time that you're taking care of a parent, is something that you do more than once. And unfortunately, you, unfortunately, that's right, and you really want to know how to do it, or you should know how to do it well, so that you get the right person there that you need at a good amount, you know, fast, rapid time, that they know how to find you, that they don't get hurt on the way in the door. And even though that you're there, it doesn't mean that mom and dad may not have, you know, they may have a lot of clutter in the house. How do you make sure they can find you in the back of the house? And then it goes through, we usually even get into, you know, how to get better care in the emergency room, how to get better treatment in the hospital, how to get out what to sign, what not to sign so that you're not financially responsible or legally responsible. And they come after you when mom and dad may run out of money. And then even how to, how to call 911 when the 911 system is down and it does go down. Hmm. I never thought about that. (laughs) Yeah, it does. It does. And quite frankly, when, when it does go down, you'll get a notice typically on your phone. You know, there's a beep sort of like those gray alerts or the purple or amber alerts or we have I had a child kidnapping the other day that down here in Florida that alerted all the phones and everything else. And those are scary, but, but they do happen. Um, and it's becoming more and more frequent around the country and around the world today. It's, it's sad, but being able to be in control of your nerves of what to say and how to be calm and succinct to get what you need for those that you're caring for is critical. Definitely. Do you have a pers- personal experience that kind of launched the thought of writing this book? 
Well, actually, it first started with um, I wanted to write a book to help other caregivers, and I thought I was going to tackle the American Red Cross first aid book. <laughs> <laughs> And now the ones that we had and the ones that, you know, I went to the local Barnes and Nobles and other stores at the time to figure out what the new ones look like. Well, they kind of look like the ones that I had when I was a Girl Scout. Not too much different. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> they haven't evolved much. <laughs> yeah. No, they haven't. They And the, the basics are still there. But what I, I realized is and even over the course of, of taking care of mom and dad and, and working with our aides and, and other caregivers is that the the first aid issues that you're dealing with with an aging parent are different than when we're, I don't want to say an able-bodied adult or child, because ideally our older or frail parents are also able-bodied in some way, shape, or form, but there are different issues. And I'm not a medical doctor. So I decided that would take too long. <laughs> and more than more likely than not, there were more of us that were starting to say, you know, what do I do? How do I do it? And emergencies happen. So we thought that that would be the best thing to tackle quickly and succinctly with the right support, first responders, paramedics. Um, my husband was a first responder, a police officer at one point. So he saw his share of tragedies and triumphs over the course of his career to deal with the trainers of paramedics and first responders, emergency room doctors, um, other other people who sort of patch things up, <laughs> AIDS, and uh, and you name it, in including a lawyer here and there, just to make sure we had everything correct too. From that perspective, what you sign, what you don't sign, and some financial advice. So it really covers a very broad gamut, but it goes into detail pretty quickly, including checklists of things that you should have in your household, just to make things different. But we had to call nine one one for my folks. I was up in Connecticut; they were down here, and the aides called to say, "What do we do?" And I said, "Well, make the darn call." <laughs> <laughs> and I would get on the cameras and and watch and be on the phone at the same time. So they had me as a backup to one keep the aides calm because they their nerves were you know off on a different scale, making sure that things happened, and that there was sort of a second set of eyes, even if it was long distance, to say, you know, is mom and dad are they going to be safe? You know, who's there as a backup if one parent goes out to the hospital? Who's left to take care of the household and the other parent that's left behind? So it was truly a, um, a, a I'll call it the three-legged stool that, that kept upright. <laughs> that makes sense. Being a retired photographer, I'm familiar with the uh, the tripod tripods, concept. right? Yep. <laughs> Still yeah, use you it. Can, you can stand on two legs if you're a person, but you can't if you're a stool. <laughs> yeah, when you're top heavy, like with my camera is heavy, you know, it just doesn't work. You got to either three legs or got to have your hand in there. So what are some common mistakes or misconceptions that caregivers often make when dealing with 911? Well, typically, you know, somebody will call 911 and they may be put on hold and they'll say, well, I, I can't put on, be put on hold. Quickly state your emergency. Is it medical? Is it fire? Or is it some sort of other kind of like robbery or break-in? So that they know whether to bring a fire department, you know, fire truck, uh, a paramedic, uh, a medical uh, person or professional, or a police officer who needs to come first. Sometimes they'll bring all three, depending upon the situation. But you don't want to use their and, and waste their resources. But quickly state what your situation is, and if they're going to put you on hold, please, if you can't wait, say no. I can't wait. I've got like a dire situation. And if you are put on hold, do not hang up. You will get put back to the you know the list, especially if there's a long list of other people that are before you on those calls. And they're going to be more frequently, they'll be calls over the holiday times. They're actually, stats say that more people die between Christmas and New Year's than any other time of the year. I've heard that. I, w I wish they would try to figure out why, because that's a fascinating, you know, Heart statistic. attack, strokes, I think a lot of it does deals to do with stress. And, Probably. You know, accidents happen. So there are things that take place and, you know, it's just, and, and on a Monday for some reason, you know, first thing in the morning on a Mondays. Yeah. Yeah. The holiday um, accidents reminds me of the time the neighbor, an older adult was hanging Christmas lights on his house and fell off the roof. <sighs> I mean, he lived, he, he was eventually okay, but that was not how you wanted to spend the month of December all bandaged up and busted no. up. No. So, no. okay. So. Don't hang up if you're put on hold. 
is it wise, and I know this is going to go against our natural instincts, but when a situation happens, I'm, you know, of course, this is like best case scenario. I would assume it would be helpful if somebody could say, oh my gosh, take a deep breath and say, what's happened? Like, how do I communicate what's happened? Like, it, I know when yep. you're going to the doctor, I went to the doctor recently, I've got <clears throat> this weird throat thing going on. And I'm like, how do I communicate? I've already done all the homeopathic stuff. I mean, I really thought through our conversation because I'm like, they only have a certain amount of time, which 911 operators have even less time than doctors. Right. And how do you communicate the, the situation? Because, of course, I'm sure we've all heard the replay of a 911 call of some sorts. And half the time you can't even understand the person because they're hysterical. Correct. Which, you know, in a lot of respects is... It's frightening. It's understandable, yeah. Mm -hmm. So how... So the, the only 911 emergency that I dealt with, and it was one person removed, after my dad spent a month in the hospital, he was home for a week. He basically had was camping, you know, living in their one step down sunken living room. Mm -hmm. And he tripped going over the, trying to get up the step. It was only mm -hmm. like four inches, but it's all it took. Yeah. And, you know, the caregiver was unable to prevent him from falling because he was much bigger than her. Right. And he, you know, smacked his noggin on the step, which was not great. Um, Especially if he's on Coumadin or other blood thinners. Yeah, he was on a ton of prescriptions, but that was yeah. not one of them, thank goodness. <laughs> but, you know, as far as I know, the caregiver was pretty calm, but... You know, I'm sure that was really scary. So a situation. So let's just analyze that situation. The situation happens. He got up to use the bathroom and he fell. So you want to call 911 because, of course, you know, you hit your head and those things bleed like crazy. Right. If there's a lot of blood. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I experienced that once with my daughter when she was a toddler. I could attest to heads bleed like crazy. So the you know, there's a lot of blood. They're on the floor. They're in pain. They're probably, knowing my dad, he was probably trying to get up. Oh, I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. What's the first thing that somebody should do in that kind of scenario? Well, you want to <clears throat> first make sure that the person's still breathing. <laughs> Number one, right? <laughs> yeah. That's a good point. Then, then you, you know, call 911. If you're calling on your cell phone, put it on speaker. Um, or if you're not calling on a cell phone, either way, you know, put it on a speaker so that you've got your hands free to deal with the person who needs the extra support. Take a deep breath. Dispatchers are trained to keep you calm and ask questions in a very specific order. They will actually walk you through that sense of, you know, how do you take the panic off? They know how to deal with people who are panicked. They will ask you, they may ask you the same question several times over. Do not get frustrated. They are not stupid. <laughs> they know exactly what they're saying and exactly what they're asking, and it's for a specific reason. So listen and put your faith in the dispatcher. The other thing to understand right now is that we are at, at an all-time low for dispatchers out there. Mm. And so if, if, if you want to volunteer or you need a part-time job or you need something else, it's a very stressful job because you're dealing with other people's panic and difficult situations, but go, go to your local department and see if they're training for new dispatchers. You're desperately needed. In some areas, they're actually looking at putting AI into the dispatch system to handle hmm. questions and calls. So that that's interesting. I'm not sure whether I'm for or against that personally, but if there's a way to do it, you know, make sure that you know, well, that's for the professionals. Um, but the other thing too is is make sure that you're also letting them know where you are because you could be dialing. Like my cell phone is a two hundred three area code. Down here in Florida is a three five two area code. They may not necessarily know physically where you are. So you want to say, "I'm calling from such and such address in the county of in the state of Florida, and and this is the town." that I'm in. So you let them know. They will ask you, but make sure you let them know because they're used to having cell phones out there. Just about everybody's got one. If you don't have one, <laughs> What's prob probably you, you, <laughs> you can't hear or you've got neuropathy or dementia or something else. But uh, 
I believe, well, I know my phone is set up with, it's, it's got, it's a, mm, they have emergency some, buttons on them. Yeah. Yeah. I, I no, no, it's, again. there's a, because when you said, um, my area code is different than the area code where I live now. Right. And that makes me think I need to double check. I'm pretty sure I updated the, it's like a, it's a 911 info. It's either yeah. an app or a website that basically says this phone number is attached to this address. Would be helpful if I could remember the what? well, but that that's good to know, you know. And it depends. Typically, a dispatcher may not be able to access that information, depending upon what sort of resources they have at their station. That's a good point. A responder may be able to look at it, but but honestly, you know, a responder is not going to go through your phone. They're just you know they're dealing with the person. They don't care about your equipment. You know, this is supposed to basically it's. It attaches your cell phone number to your physical address somehow, and they don't have to go through your phone. But now I'm going to have to figure it out. So I but can if you're not update right, people. Yeah, double check it because if you're not physically at that address at the time, it may be able to follow you. But you know, glitches happen. You know, I, I we love technology; <laughs> it works great until it doesn't. Right? Exactly true. <laughs> it's like the car works until it doesn't, <laughs> or wherever else. You know, the other thing that I highly recommend and everybody can get one is, you know, there, everybody says get an app on your phone with all your medical information and records. I highly recommend that everybody get a, a, a document. They can get it at howtosurvive911.com and download. It's a PDF of all your medical history. It's a, it's a fillable file. You can fillable PDF. You can put your information in there. You can take it off. You can update it. It's very easy to use with instructions on how many you should have. It's just a paper document front and back. Put it on your refrigerator, on mom and dad's refrigerator. Uh, you can even sometimes get a little red folder that you can, or it's sort of like a little plastic thing you can stick on your refrigerator if you've got a magnetized refrigerator for emergencies. But if you don't have something like that, I say simply get one of those little sandwich bags, put a red piece of paper on it and say, in case of emergency, file of life, and just put it and stick it on your refrigerator on the front door or in a visible spot so that in case any responder comes in in case of an emergency, whether you're conscious or not conscious or your parents are conscious or not, they have that information right there. That simple document, filled out accurately, has helped save more people than you understand, than anybody will even know. Because it saves it saves minutes in, in an emergency situ situation. A first responder will also know if there's any particular type of situation like an allergy to a medication, whether there's hearing aids and whether there's a heart monitor or, a, or a, um, a pacemaker to do an AED, those are important things for them to know. Yeah, that's true. I never thought about a pacemaker and the, the defibrillator. I'm right? assuming you're not supposed to do do that on somebody with a pacemaker you're not supposed to but you know i guess they you know, there are new ones out there that are that have, you know i am not an aed expert as far as what the <laughs> new technology is but still you know even even if and you don't know what equipment a particular vehicle has got or whether it is you know at any point in time the aeds right now also in facilities they have to monitor those because the batteries die out and last only about a year. They're powerful batteries that they need. So that's important it. to know, right? And it's a magnetic yeah. device. Yeah, they're and sending a lot something. of jewels through your body. I think that's the right term. Yeah. You know, I'll, 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 I'll refrain from that experience if at all possible. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, yeah <laughs> me too. But if I need it, I'd, I'd kind of like to make sure that somebody knew how to do it and that it, it would give me a kickstart. <laughs> <laughs> so even in a household like mine, we don't have health issues. You know, we think we're still, quote, young and healthy. But accidents is, happen, right? This is true. Well, my husband is on Pradaxa, which is a blood thinner. And I am I am allergic to penicillin, although I got a rash when I was like three, maybe younger. So I, I question and I've I've actually asked the doctor to test me, but they're they were they didn't want to. Because I'm wondering, you know, like, am I really allergic or was it just an anecdotal issue? They're like, there's so many other antibiotics, they don't worry about it. But obviously, we should probably have at least that posted on the fridge because neither one of us wear, a, you know, a medical alert bracelet. So he probably yeah. should. 
Yeah, and you want to send a copy with the paramedics to to the emergency department. You want to take one with you to the hospital. You want to have an extra one on file, and you want to have a backup just in case the you know they lose it at the hospital with somebody. <laughs> but you know, a lot of stuff gets lost between home and there. And there's there's a lot of stuff that's going on. There's a lot of energy between the the responders that are there, between the ambulance of transportation, and between what's happening in an emergency room. Maybe maybe mom or dad may not necessarily be the one that needs the priority. It could be somebody else, and that piece of paper may be stuck in under a blanket and disappear. So, you know, it's 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 one of those things that you have to say technology is great when you've got it with a you know an app on your phone but if somebody has to go looking for an app on my phone forget it there's like too much stuff on here <laughs> oh see i'm i'm madam organized i have almost everything is in a, in folders and i have a folder that says health so it would be easy to find my stuff but then they have to be able to get into your phone which right. okay i guess if you're present they can hold it up to your face um, but, you know, don't complicate the situation. I just wonder, because I'm picturing, you know, getting rushed into the emergency room and, you know, I guess this begs the question, should you go with the ambulance or go behind the ambulance? You go or? behind the ambulance. They would typically not allow you in the ambulance with somebody unless it's a child. Okay. And even then that that may not be the case. But yes, if you are if you want to be in the emergency room or go to the emergency room with a loved one and you can and you don't have somebody else who needs your help back home, then follow the ambulance. But do it at at a, at a safe pace. Don't panic. Just get there, arrive alive. Arrive. Well, yeah, that would be that would be beneficial. Right? Don't add to the emergency by having an auto yeah. accident. Um yeah, see, I didn't. I didn't have any of those experiences. My only experience with an ambulance ride is my my daughter was doing tricks on a swing and landed on her head on the concrete, Ooh. and yeah, um, she screamed and yelled for a while, and I surprisingly was quite calm. I don't know why. Everybody else was completely coming unglued. Mom and, stuff kicked in. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> and you know, I'm like, everybody, shut up. I think she's okay, but of course. You know, my mom and my paternal grandmother were there and they're all freaking out that she's, you know, halfway to dead. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, we went in the ambulance and about halfway between my parents' house where the accident happened in the hospital, my darling little child said, why is the lights and sirens not on? I'm like, because you're not <laughs> cool enough. <laughs> it's like, she's fine. We can turn around now. <laughs> and she was. She had a bump mm -hmm. on her head. They did x-rays. She was young enough. You could see her permanent teeth that hadn't come in. It was quite fascinating, but yeah. Yeah. Um, I only had one experience in, in an ambulance after a car accident myself with uh, a couple of broken legs and not, not a pretty situation. But I, the only thing I remember is going over the railroad tracks, and that hurt because when you've got two broken legs, <laughs> that was, you know, in and out of consciousness. I don't remember too much, but I do remember going over the bumps and like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I flew off my bike and broke my collarbone the Wednesday Ooh. before Memorial Day 2016. And it's the only bone I've ever broken. Do not recommend. Yeah, mine um, was on a Super Bowl Sunday, so. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> Don't um, get stuff done on holidays. <laughs> yeah, for real. My husband was in total panic mode, especially when he got to the hospital behind the ambulance, because I knocked myself clean cold. Right. I, re I remember very little. And it was lucky for me that they didn't realize that I didn't, I didn't know what the heck was going on because had they been aware of my cognitive lacking at the moment, mm -hmm. I would have gone to the trauma center, which I certainly Ooh. could not have afforded. Yeah. And I'm fine. You know, I got a metal plate that sometimes when it, it's about terrain, it decides it thinks it's got to let me know, which I don't need to know. So. <laughs> but for the most part, I'm totally fine. As fine as I was before I flew off my bike. <laughs> But my husband shows up and he's in a panic and they're like, go over there. And he's trying to argue with them. And so once you get to the ER, how should a family member proceed? Like, not like my husband, obviously. No, you, you, you know. So if you, you, the patient arriving by ambulance, they will take care of you. Then you, the family member arrives, you let them know who you are. 
that you'd like to see, if possible, your loved one who's in the back and the in the emergency room itself getting the support, they will either let you in or not, depending upon what's happening. More likely than not, they'll let you in. And they may need everything from insurance information or vital information that they have that that maybe didn't arrive with your loved one. And then they're probably going to ask you to sign a certain amount, a lot of, well, not a certain amount, a certain number of documents. In that case, I highly recommend you sign as the POA or whatever it is. You do not sign without some sort of way to, to legally distinguish yourself from the patient. And you technically don't have to sign for them because you do not want to be responsible for their financial debts. Yeah, especially if your parent spends 32 days in the hospital. Yep. And may or may not have insurance. I mean, Medicare will cover a certain amount, but not 100% of it. And if they don't have a supplemental insurance, then that's another issue. And still, you know, bills happen. And there are too many people out there right now. Medical debt, I think, is something like it's huge. Know, it's, something. it's huge. But it's, I heard some some number that just floored me on the amount of people that are now dealing with medical debt at the moment. And it's large and it's just going to get larger over over the years. So yeah, that's something that's a, to consider. Yeah. It's and you can you can negotiate hospital bills. So understand that. Don't panic. Don't worry about it. The first thing you want to do is make sure that you get the best possible care for the person that you love that needs it. So in a scenario where maybe you're right behind the ambulance mm-hmm. and you show up and they've barely had time to even look at your family member and you're like with my mom, she ended up in the ER, the care home somehow couldn't dial my cell phone number properly. One of those days when technology was failing them because they kept telling me, well, we tried to call you, but, and then I forgot what your the mom will be was. in the, in the emergency room by herself alone. Yeah, which with advanced Alzheimer's was probably not helpful. And she may not get the care that she needs. Uh, Mm. I was talking to somebody a couple of weeks ago who works as a nurse and working in a care facility. And I asked them, they had said there were like seven different calls to the paramedics that day. I mean, there were a lot. There was a lot of stuff that was going on. And I said, of all those people that went that were under your care at a facility, how many people had had a representative or somebody keeping an eye on them when they got to the hospital and could talk to the doctors. She said, zero, not one. And in some cases I've heard of of the facilities not calling the family because they didn't want to wake somebody up at 12 o'clock at night. It's like, are you kidding me? If it was me, I'd, I'd be down there saying, all right, I'm, I'm not a violent person, but (laughs) you're going to need medical attention Yeah, <laughs> if you don't call me. <laughs> and what my mom, so my mom had, she basically had two unobserved falls, one yeah. of which she ended up with a cut above her eye and it needed stitches. So I'm sure yeah, that was bleeding like crazy. Too. Yep. And that happened early in the morning. So they wouldn't have woke me up. Um, and they may not have even known for how long that, you know, it was unobserved and there wasn't anybody around that even noticed that she had this fall if she was in a room by herself or even if your mm-hmm. dad was asleep, right? And didn't. Yeah, no, she was she was in a room by herself. My dad passed away and then we moved her to memory care. And they, for whatever reason, couldn't read my I mean, they said, This is your cell, this is the number we're calling. I'm like, that's my cell phone. They're like, Well, we called it and so they dialed it while I was there and it rang. And they're like, Ugh. So I yeah. don't know really what happened, but they were very good with her. So I don't think it was intentional it was yeah. a mistake yeah somebody just you know probably in a panic was dialing the wrong number but understand so, if your parents mm-hmm. are in a care facility you know one or both that if there is an emergency and you can't be there or somebody else can't be there they're going to be there alone and that's and they may not get the attention that they need because there's nobody there to one advocate for them the information may not be correct as far as what the what the the extent of the issue is. They could be having a heart attack, a stroke. You don't know. That information may, have, may not have gotten from the facility or the, the care provider, the nurse that was there, whoever was there. 
to the paramedics. The paramedics be may be overloaded with information and not and working on the next one. And then all of a sudden there's this sense of chaos that happens in an emergency room. There's a lot of people to take care of, even if there aren't a lot of people needing care at the time. Those doctors and professionals, their minds are on everything else that they need to do. That makes sense. I wonder. And youth and, and <laughs> severity of situation gets top priority. Yeah. So I'm sure they probably stitched up my mom and then the care home came. I don't know how she even got back because by the time yeah. they got a hold of me, she was like basically back headed back to the yeah. care home. But what we found out That's later, several hours, you figure, right? On average. Yeah. Um, I mean, she'd probably already been stitched up and they were probably just waiting on whatever before they you know, before I got the phone call. But what happened? It's not a 30 that, minute visit. <laughs> oh, God, no. Probably. I don't even know how long she could have been there. Now I'm curious, but I'm sure I can't find out at this point. But she had actually fractured her pelvis in Ooh. this fall. And the only way I found out, because a week later, she had serious pain walking. And mm -hmm. we had just, we had a neurology neurologist appointment that day. I managed to get there early. We managed to get out of the care home early. So I think she actually had an eye doctor appointment. Then the neurologist. So in between, I took her to urgent care and right. they were useless. As, mm, don't get me started on that. Because she was weight bearing, they're like, well, she didn't break a hip. And I'm like, dude, you don't go from zero to 10 in it's arthritis. A, it was probably a hairline fracture that was causing it was. The pain, just getting worse, right? Yeah. Well, then what happened was mom fell March 8th, 2020, <sighs> broke her leg. And when they x rayed to find, they actually had to do a CAT scan, I think it was, or an MRI. They had to. They had to do something beyond a, a typical x-ray to right. find the breaks. And when they did, they said, were you aware of this um, fracture on her pelvis? And I'm like, no, no. but I know when it happened. <laughs> yeah, right. So you yeah. kind of wonder, like, I don't think, I don't think I would have even thought to have them, like, x-ray her to see if anything else was wrong. Would that even be something they do? Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. They may, they may not, but that's, that's where it's important to have somebody who knows the individual and knows how they behave when they're in pain, right? Even if there's dementia, somebody who's got dementia is going to behave differently when they're in pain than when they're not, whether it be mm -hmm. physical or emotional pain. Pain is pain. And you want to understand what's different and start questioning. And not in an obnoxious way, because the medical professionals they have their routine of what to go through, sort of a step series of questions as well. But that's when you start asking, say, you know, have we thought about this? Could this possibly be? And you start the dialogue back and forth so that it becomes, a, I say, a partnership in, in, in union and in care for the person for the right reason. Makes perfectly good sense. I did not have that with her doctors. Um, I've never had a lot of good interactions with the medical system unfortunately um so avoiding them is generally my mo yeah i understand 
So, but if you can't be there, so if you like in our particular case, I was 1200 miles away. I, beyond my aids, I had a team of, of friends that were my folks that were, that were friends of my folks that were very, very close to mom and dad. Um, one couple in particular who I would stay at their house when I couldn't, there wasn't a couch or anything to, you know, in the care facility where mom and dad were at the time till we moved them out of there. And they said, please, you know, if there is anything that we can do, if there's an issue, anytime, day or night, call me, I will be there for your mother or your dad. And I did. And they were always there, you know, just to sort of be my second set of eyes and ears before we had full-time 24-7 aids. And I had to tell you, that was, that was our lifeline because Jacqueline knew my mother inside and out. They were, they were thick as thieves and <laughs> they, I think they were probably sisters from another mother at another point in their lives at some point. And they, she knew she would say, Nance, here's the situation and let's have the conversation of what we need to do to talk to the doctor. And it was, it was a, it was a three-way team that we got it done. His dad would just always be oblivious. He was just <laughs> scared to death that something would happen to her. So he would block it. That was the way that he handled pain. It just, he blocked it out. Well, that and let us girls me... take care of it. Yeah, for real. <laughs> well, that was going to lead me to my next question, which is how can caregivers manage their own stress in these situations so that you're not adding to the, basically the drama and you can, you know, be a better person care partner yeah. for the medical professionals you know like obviously your dad tuning things out that probably wasn't real helpful <laughs> that was that wasn't great for dad no it wasn't great for mom either but we had the right people there for her and for him too when we needed it so that was that was key but when when you're in a state of panic and i have seen that as well i've seen my aides just get emotionally distraught and not know what to do uh, you know sort of the the last I will call extreme situation was when my mom had an aneurysm uh, mm. and and went into um, a convulsion in the emergency oh. room with our our lead aide at her side, and this was sort of this was the last that's sort of the last um, couple of days for mom, and I was able to get down that that next morning when this was all happening, and I could hear the panic in in her voice. I mean. It, Total. She just totally lost it and didn't know what to do. Thankfully, when that happened, there was a nurse that was there who made sure that she got out of the room, they handled their situation, and they were able to calm her down. So there are good, there are good professionals out there. Doctors less so because that's not their job necessarily. <laughs> but you know, a good doctor will know how to just sort of take that edge off of somebody to to sort of jolt them back into a, a sense of reality of what's happened and to have a conversation. And, you know, her job was to make sure she got me on the phone. So I knew exactly what was going on. And then I calmed her down on the phone. Okay. Let's take a deep breath. Let's talk about it. Let's understand what we're dealing with. A little dose of reality of what is exactly was happening hurt, you know, it hurt my heart. It hurt my head. It, it hurt her too, because she was seeing it and I wasn't. And I didn't have a video camera to watch this, but I instinctively knew how to sort of, all right, what's my next role? You know, one foot in front of the other. And that's all you can think about in a situation like that is the next move is to put the next foot in front of the other foot and just keep moving forward that you need to do to get to that decision, to make the right decision at that point in time. It may not be the perfect decision. That's okay. At but least you're making a decision. You're moving you're forward. You're making a decision, Right. And and you can always change a yes or no to some extent. I mean, obviously, but but getting the support that you need when you are in a panic, ideally having somebody there at your side, whether it be a first responder, a dispatcher, a, a medical professional, a neighbor, somebody there just to hold your hand and just sort of take that electric energy or even on the other end of the phone and ground it as much as possible. That's, so that's... if you're that other person, know that your job is to just sort of take the emotion out as much as possible. Let them have, you know, they're a little bit of, you know, it's okay. The head, head and heart can work together, but just take a little bit of wind out of those sails so they can get, they can catch their breath. Do you have any advice for caregivers 
who don't feel like their loved one's getting a di- the right diagnosis or, and this happens more in doctor's offices, but it was happening during COVID in hospitals where they won't let the spouse go in with their right. partner. And I know they do that to make sure that there's not any abuse, but if your person can't answer questions logically, you need to be with them. So right. when you're, when the system is not working with you and you're stressed because there's an emergency, your person's in pain, something's going wrong. Do you have any suggestions on what people can do? Because yeah, you need to get somebody in, in the facility there who's going to be able to communicate with you if you can't physically get in there. And you mentioned something real that a lot of people don't know about, that if there's been an accident and there's blood and the patient is female, and the caregiver is male, they will typically not let the male in there. I've actually had in my, the support group. It can group happen the other way of, around too. Yeah. But yeah if, if there's any concern of any kind of abuse, they will not let the other person in. So that's important to help them understand what the relationship is. It happened to a friend of mine when his wife had uh, early onset Alzheimer's a form of a form of Alzheimer's and moved very quickly. She was, they were two of them were out bicycling. She has an accident, lots of blood, and he takes her to the emergency room. They separated the two to make sure that this was not a form of abuse and he didn't know it. Mm. So I don't know if that would be better or worse, you know, because well, you have, bicycle- to make, you have to, yeah, you, I, in that particular case, just you want to find that there, if there's an advocate inside the hospital, if it's not an nurse, nurse, is there an aide or is there somebody inside the hospital that can help you have another set of eyes and ears of what's going on and be that advocate in that communication? And you have to remain calm, not to the point of being like totally out of it, like you're like, like you're numbing, you don't care, but to just let them know exactly what the situation is and and why why this even happened cuz they don't know they don't know whether this is a a form of abuse or purely just an accident that makes sense i would think you could maybe tap the social worker in a hospital anybody who is there ask for help who's there can be an advocate who can hail the hand of the person explain that there there there's a sense of delirium that's going on that they don't know what to do. How can how can we help the situation? So there are there are people in the hospital who can help you, and and ask for it, reach out for it. I mean, don't go in there assuming nobody wants to help you, like I usually do. <laughs> try try not to go in alone. <laughs> I mean, my husband ended up in the hospital during COVID. <clears throat> yeah, I was twenty one, with um, second bout of blood clots, which is why he's on blood thinners. Um, he knew what was going on and they would not, they wouldn't let me pass the front door, which, you know, not going to lie, wasn't terribly unhappy about. (laughs) I mean, I knew what the routine was going to be. He knew what the routine was going to be. I didn't want to be sitting there in the ER waiting room. (laughs) Well, there may also have been a lot of chaos going on in the emergency room behind the scenes that you didn't know behind the door either. And what was happening, they may not have had the physical room for you. So just being able to get somebody to sort of give you a, a, an update of what's happening. And when things calm down, chances are, you know, the more likely than not, they'll, they'll let a spouse in. Yeah. They let us, let me in when he was assigned to a room. Yeah. But I think this was Which a can COVID. take a long time. It did. It was the next day. I was like yeah. fully dressed, fully refreshed, eaten. I'd done my workout. <laughs> this is making me sound very callous. But yeah, no, I think it was a COVID protocol. But, could be. And if they've got a phone and they can talk to yeah. you, at least you can be the advocate on the phone too. There yeah. are other ways to do that. Yeah, I did that last year when he he went to the ER again. This man needs to stop going to the ER. <laughs> and he needs to stop going without me, apparently. But yeah, no, he, um, he had to talk to a doctor and I said, you put that phone on speaker. And yeah, I absolutely. I let them know exactly, you know, which T's they were crossing and which I's they were dotting because I was done with the baloney that he was getting he'd been getting the runaround um right and he had or a- maybe even given like my husband was in the hospital a couple of years ago with it with an issue and they were going to give him a blood thinner he already had blood thinners he was not mm. going to get another one and Yikes. they said well it's protocol if you're if you're here for 24 hours and it's like guess what 
I'm not going to, I'm not going to bleed out here. So you can take your protocol elsewhere, <laughs> but yeah, that's he had stupid. the wherewithal. Yeah, I know. Oh my uh, God. But he had the wherewithal to know what, what medications he had and where he was going to, and you, that you have the right to refuse certain amount of care. Yeah. I think that's what we forget. It's like, it, you have the right to say no. Yeah. Really and we, do. we want to get better. We want to feel better. We want our problem to go away. So we, we try to be compliant and, and, in good patients and that's not always in our best interest mistakes but... happen mistakes happen there are lots of people who are in and out there are lots of different doctors that are there that maybe not be your doctor that necessarily know your situation and you know there are nurses that are in that don't know you or don't know your loved one so make sure you have all the information and in fact the the information that they have on 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 a door or a write-up somewhere wherever it is is correct it makes sense. Yeah. They, when he was, so he was in the hospital a year ago, they gave him like the flu shot, the pneumonia shot, but they didn't give him a COVID vaccine. Cause they said, you've had your, your latest booster. He's like, no, I haven't. And he literally pulls up our hospital system app he said, see, right. this is when I had the last one. They're like, no, no, no. And he's like, check your records. I mean, you know, well, it's important to understand that not all systems talk to one another too. Yeah. Well, he was in, this was all in our system. And yeah. they still had the information wrong. So, it happens. It does happen. Yeah. Fortunately, I mean, it was just, you know, a COVID booster. It wasn't life or death. Like, God forbid, giving them a second blood thinner makes me cringe. Right? Yeah. But yeah, it's just so you, you to, to wrap up. So I don't talk to you for two hours like I'm <laughs> capable of doing. We want to make sure we have all the information on hand. We get send the, the right. Get get the book. How to survive nine one one medical emergencies yeah. step by step before, during, and after. I promise you, it is a very short read. It's about one hundred and twenty page pages. It's very easy. There's pictures in there, checklists. So it's a quick scan. You can go to any page that you want to say, "Ah, oh, this is what I need to do now." But I you know it's it's something that you can read very quickly and get the basics of of what you need to do so that you don't panic. And you are have you do have a certain level of control, and you'll know what to say and not say, or do or not do, so that you get the support that you need for yourself or somebody else that you love. So that's excellent information. I'll make sure the book is linked in the show notes. Where can people find out more about you and your show? Because obviously you've got great yeah. information to share, and we can't always just do it on my show. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what the podcast community, we are great. So my show is Elder Care Success. You can get that at eldercaresuccess.live. And from there, you can get all the shows. I think we're now up to like 85 episodes or so. We're a fairly new show. And um, there you can subscribe to Apple or Spotify or any of the other platforms that you want. You can send me a note. If you have a question, there's a tab on that page on the right-hand side that says, send Nancy a voicemail. You can even send me a question in voicemail, and I may play it on the air and say, oh, here's the question that we can answer today. So there's a lot of ways to communicate with me. And uh, then there's also YouTube. We have a new station on YouTube, and that's Elder Care Success on YouTube. There's only a few videos there, but it's, it's a little bit more fun, as I call them, or somebody told me they're snackables. So <laughs> I like that term. Yeah. I said, I don't want anybody to take a bite out of me, but you know what? <laughs> Go for it. Awesome. Well, this is fantastic. And I'm over 300 episodes at this point. And this is Ooh. not a topic we've talked about. I know I've been a busy gal, but it's been over six years. So <laughs> yeah, well, I'm I'm only about a, about a year, a little, about a year in. So we're not so bad. No. Um, but it's an important topic, and I'm glad that we were able to share this with my listeners. Yeah, it's been it's been fabulous, Jennifer. Thank you so much. And a, and a pleasure to be with a, another compatriot, as they say, on the whole, how do you take care of mom and dad and those that you love who just might need a little extra support, and maybe even you do, too. Yep, it's, it's an important topic, and uh, we got to get Apple and Spotify to give us our own category. <laughs> Absolutely, <nice>. yeah. <laughs> I call it, what the heck do I do next? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Just, well, there's, I think it was you. We looked up the AA slash NA supportive type podcasts, and there's a whole bunch of those. Yeah. So there's like a whole group of us that are just sort of out in the wilderness and in, you know, a category. We're a little harder to find because they can't figure out how to. Well, it's a, it's a growing space. And as there's so many people who are getting older, 
that's good. That's a good thing. Yeah. But in the meantime, we don't we don't know when it's going to happen to us or somebody else or that we love. And yeah, there are even more kids who need help that are going to need caregiving that for the rest of their lives. So it's not it's not a subject to be taken or ignored. I don't want to say taken lightly, but just to be ignored. Yeah, pretty much anybody will need this information, and if you don't, this information is not going to call, not going to clog up your memories. So, and chicken just, soup doesn't save everything. <laughs> that's true. I thought it was really good. So, <laughs> well, I appreciate this, and good luck with your show. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs>